So the learning objectives for this session are to spot diagnose the if you miss it they die ECGs in the emergency department. The other way to think about this is the if you miss it you, you'll fail a VAQ or a ski question on the exam. So the essential ECGs not to miss in the exam or in your day-to-day -day practice include Brugada syndrome, Wolf Parkinson White, Hockham or Hockham, which is hyper, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, long QT, and we'll go through some fairly detailed explanation about the long QT ECG, a second degree no bits type 2 block, and a bi or tri fascicular block. Now I'm going to whiz through these fairly quickly, and I'm not going to delve into the physiology, but I encourage you to look each of these up and uh, get familiar with the physiology behind them. So the first spot diagnosis ECG we're going to look at, which is once you get the pattern in your head, is quite strikingly obvious, and that is the Brugada syndrome ECG. What you'll notice in this ECG when you glance, when you turn the question over and you glance at the ECG, the first thing that will jump out, you, out at you is this, the complexes in V1 and V2. It'll look initially like a right bundle branch block and you'll think, oh, I know it's a right bundle, but then if you look more closely, you'll see that there is this ST elevation and then quite marked T wave inversion. So if you see a right bundle with ST elevation, T wave inversion, think Brugada syndrome. So Brugada syndrome is a congenital problem related to a sodium channelopathy and that causes abnormal repolarization, which puts the patient at risk for uh, death or sudden cardiac death from VT or VF and uh, especially polymorphic VT. So if you get a patient who's come in with syncope and they have this ECG, don't send them home. This is just a quick note to show you that there's three types of Brugada syndrome. I'm not going to go through all three of them. You can look them up if you want to know the specifics. Because it's most strikingly abnormal, chances are in the exam, if you're going to get one, you'll probably get a type 1 because most people are going to confuse this T wave changes here and call it in a right bundle with ischemia or something like that and completely miss the point. The type 2 and type 3 are a bit more subtle. It might come up, so it's worth kind of knowing about, but uh, yeah, you can read up about those in your own time. The next ECG is Wolf Parkinson White. Again, this is a bog standard exam classic that you need to be able to pick. The reason you need to be able to pick it is because if these people go into AF, they can have sudden cardiac death and drop dead. And if you've missed it and sent them home, uh, without referring them to an electrophysiologist, then you haven't really done your duty. This is a very subtle example. It's probably not the best example, but what you're looking for is the uh, upsloping at the start of the QRS complex. Again, it's very subtle in this ECG. You can just kind of make out the delta wave there. And that's the pathognomonic feature. The other thing you'll sometimes see with Wolf Parkinson White is a short PR interval. Short PR, upsloping QRS at the start or delta wave is WPW. So this is just another up close example of a pretty obvious delta wave. I'll put this in because this is the WPW and AF ECG, which I went through in the last video, which has some interesting physiology behind it. You need to know about it. This actually came up in my ski exam, the 2009.1 exam, and you had to be able to verbally discuss this ECG and your treatment of it. So uh, make sure you check out the previous video I did on WPW and AF and uh, make sure you know this inside out. The next ECG is uh, Hockham or Hockham or Hypertrophic Obstructive Cardiomyopathy. Another name for this, which took me a long time to get my head around. But uh, once I did, it was really quite obvious what the problem with it is. It's subaortic stenosis. So it's essentially congenital, you know, it works the same as congenital aortic stenosis in a young person. It's a, it's a congenital problem or a genetic problem where you get hypertrophy of your left ventricular outflow tract of the heart. You can't increase or you can't pump out blood well enough out of your left ventricular outflow tract. So it acts like a blocked aortic valve. And the compensatory response for that you get is um, left ventricular hypertrophy. The way that's manifest on the ECG is you'll get 
this left, ventric left ventricular hypertrophy pattern with a strain pattern as well. Strain means this deep lateral T wave inversion and ST depression. So if you get a young patient, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, with syncope, big voltage QRSs, and deep lateral ST changes and T wave inversion, think hokum. They are at risk for sudden cardiac death from arrhythmias because I've just got a big heart and it's potentially going to have arrhythmias, and also from uh, microvascular ischemia because they just can't um, get the oxygen supply to the myocardium that they need. So especially exertional syncope, exertional collapses, and you see this ECG, you've got to worry about it. This is another Hokum ECG, and it's just worth noting another thing that you'll sometimes read about in the textbooks is these Q waves. Usually septal, anteroseptal Q waves, and again when you go back and read up about the physiology of this in the textbooks, it's because you're getting septal hypertrophy as well as LVH, and that changes the direction of repolarization through the septum, and you'll get these septal Q waves. So LVH, strain pattern and septal Q waves, think hokum. This could also, don't forget, be ischemic with this sort of pattern, but it's a differential you must not forget. 